Uh, Bob, let's start with the Good. interview. Um, for those who have an interest in understanding service and service business, but are perhaps a little new to service dominant logic, um, in just a very few words, what does service dominant logic mean? Service dominant logic um, is a perspective for looking at everything around us, actually in terms of not only business activities, but society and the world in general, and recognizing that we're all here to serve one another through our competencies and skills and capabilities, and that at some point we realize in our human evolution the way to do that is through a division of labor, and even the word labor suggests physical <laughs> labor, it's really a division of competencies. And so as we sit here in Italy, Italy has some uh, wonderful wines, and you know the wine grower and winemaker in Italy at some point realizes the best way to get that switch watch is not to learn about watchmaking but to really develop his or her competencies and skills and growing grapes and the whole process of wine making but similarly the watchmaker in Switzerland who loves to drink wine realizes it's probably best not to kind of figure out the wine and tilling the soil and cultivating it but to specialize in uh, the watchmaking and then we exchange, and over time what happens are there's uh, intermediaries that develop, in part the tangible goods the intermediary, because the skills and competencies of the, of the watchmaker is embedded in that watch and in the wine, the skills and competencies and the knowledge has developed over hundreds if not thousands of years. But, but it's really much bigger, it really is a very, in part it's evolutionary, but it's part it's really revolutionary. And so you start to view uh, even planet Earth as an ecosystem that's delivering service. I live in Arizona. Arizona is very hot uh, for a considerable length of time. We have cooler winters and falls, but it's very hot. And I was teaching an executive class recently and mentioned to the executives because it was very hot out. It was in the summer. And somebody had brought up the uh, topic of energy, we had a really big spike about uh, 12 months ago in energy prices and in U.S. dollars a barrel of oil went I think as hard, high as $150, very high. I made the comment, I said, well, we really don't have an energy uh, problem. Well, we have an energy problem, we have too much energy. Said, well, we don't have too much energy, no, we have all these like sh energy shortages and, and you know we see these rising prices of oil. And I said, well, that's interesting because we're sitting in this air-conditioned building. It's 104 degrees out Fahrenheit, and we have the temperature at 68 degrees to dissipate all the heat and all the energy that Mother Earth is giving us for free. And then we're using carbon fuels to kind of dissipate that and so on. So if you look at trees planted near a house, provide shade, uh, planted on a hill, if you figure out uh, the right way to irrigate and plant, you avoid erosion. Uh, the Panama Canal after it was built because they had to tear up a lot of vegetation. You know, you kept on having sediment going into the canal and they kept on trying to engineer it. And then they realized, well, gee, if we replant it and water it right, then like nature will take care of that. So really, nature provides a service. You know, I, I frequently, like if it rains and you have a shortage of rain, every time it rains on your city, if you could kind of measure the rainfall uh, over... Uh, you know, thousands and thousands of hectares or acres or whatever area of land you want to measure for the people. He said, now if I had to buy that from the municipality, the water municipality in, in, in Rome or Tucson, it would cost a fortune and it just kind of comes down. So that there's this kind of this whole notion that there are these flows that occur in everyday life, either through our activities and specializations as we evolve as humans or in the natural environment. So then how can we think about business, how can we think about society, how can we think about government in that particular way. So it really, you know, we, we view everything as service business. So for, for the practitioner in the audience or doctor student that had practiced, now they're coming at and getting a PhD, it, it's much more than services marketing, but it's kind of service as the fundamental flow that occurs in society. Mm -hmm. Now, there's probably a story to everything, and, and service dominant logic may not be an exception. 
um, is there a story to how the movement that we're now calling service dominant logic movement started? Well, there is. You know, every logic or philosophy or theory has a history. Uh, and it has a history that the history I identify with is what I've interfaced with. And I had the opportunity of being uh, dean of the College of Business at the University of Oklahoma uh, in the 1980s, of 86, 87 through early 90s, 92. Uh, and uh, towards the end of that tenure, uh, we had a very successful business person apply to the doctoral program and of course you know you there's a bias in science kind of science favors youth and being a little bit naive and willing to kind of listen to the professor who's the expert and so uh, Stephen Vargo uh, was applying to the program Steve and I have written now a lot as everybody's aware uh, but he was stubborn and he insisted and so I took him on and uh, we started to work together uh, he was very successful in uh, the uh, travel business, wholesale distribution, a variety of things, which as he read the literature, he said, well, that's kind of services, so that what I, that's what I want to study. And so he went and he read, and he read Christian Gronrose and Hubert Gumason, and went back and read Adam Smith, and everybody had talked about services, even philosophers. I mean, Aristotle talked about uh, the, the services that people had provided and the role of merchants and middlemen, they were providing services and they weren't providing any value. And so he went and read and read and read. My area was primarily distribution, logistics, warehousing, retailing, moving stuff. A lot in the food industry, the hardware industry, and so on. He came to my office one day and he said, well, Bobby, he said, it occurs to me that my interest in services really ties really well with what you're doing in distribution and and we talked and we went to dinner and uh, I said well that's really interesting because since you've taken this interest I've been kind of rethinking some of my ideas and it, it thoughts kind of increasingly occurring to me that you know tangible goods are really distribution vehicles they help to provide service and I'd worked a lot in the industrial area so you have a new automated warehouse or forklifts it's capital equipment but it's replacing labor service, or you have labor service with it that kind of creates something else. And so we start to explore those uh, ideas. And then uh, towards the end of his uh, term uh, in the doctoral program, we had this wonderful draft of a manuscript. Uh, and uh, it actually, parts of it started out in a history of management class from Professor Wren, from Dan Wren. Uh, and uh, I had just become, now I was no longer dean, and I had become the editor of the Journal of Marketing. Well, the, the American Marketing Association has a policy, which is probably a good policy, that the editor can't select uh, his or own, her own articles to publish. Uh, probably makes sense. Of course, the way you become editor is you become well-known, but then you can't publish in the journal. Uh, and so I mentioned to Steve, well, we could submit this to another journal, but as we talked about it, we thought, you know, really, it, if we could publish the article in the Journal of Marketing, it would have a much broader impact. People, Because people, and I don't think this is right, but they would take it much more seriously because really what we were challenging was largely a lot of North American thinking. <laughs> you know, we weren't so much charging what the Nordic School had developed and these wonderful insights, but uh, we were kind of challenging. Even to this day, we get much more... Uh, visibility, respect, interest among young scholars, business people, and in, in, uh, outside of North America, primarily in Europe and Australia and Asia. Uh, and so it was a real interesting uh, history to, to what really had developed there, and it really became a very much a kind of co-production, co co-creation type of activity and has, has continued to this day. We're now on separate faculties. Steve's at the University of Hawaii, I'm, at, I'm now at the University of Arizona. But we continue to have this wonderful, productive working relationship. So, but you know, the history could go back much, much longer. But that's kind of the, kind of the short history of it. It shows you the power of surprise because, frankly, 
you know, he shouldn't have been in a PhD program. Uh, he shouldn't have taken on trying to publish in the lead journal. When he graduated, he should have taken just a teaching position, not a research position. Uh, but he was stubborn. <laughs> and uh, I kind of appreciated that. And so there was kind of that synergy that developed.